Hi, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, good day to everybody there. Today I'm going to be talking about exclusive milk expression. So some people call that exclusive pumping. And that's what I will refer to it throughout today's um, quick little uh, tour of exclusive pumping. Um, some, um, I have no conflicts of interest to report, but I think it's important that we're all on the same page. So I'm just gonna quickly go through some definitions. Uh, a breast chest feeder I use as a overarching term for a lactating person and breast or chest feeding, I'll probably just say breastfeeding, um, is feeding human milk no matter the, um, modality of feeding that milk so whether it's by a bottle or at the breast or in an, a supplemental nursing system um, i use that term as an umbrella term which reflects what people generally in the exclusive pumping community do as well and when i do refer to at the breast um, i'll generally say direct nursing or nursing and then of course exclusively pumping i'll um, define that um, as um, exclusively expressing your milk and it doesn't mean it has that person has to have always done that um at least for as far as i'm concerned just that at some point in time the milk that they were um making was only expressed it wasn't fed at the the breast or chest and then a lactation care provider um, i use that as an inclusive term for anyone giving lactation care regardless of their qualification so it doesn't have to just be an ibclc could be a peer supporter um, could be a clc and then of course nicu is short for neonatal intensive care unit so what do you think is the approximate percentage of breastfeeders that exclusively pump have a think about, you know, if you're in practice, have a think about the numbers of people that you see potentially and what you've been thinking of. So in the US, we have some um, data on this and, you know, we sort of were pegging it around five to 7% because that was what was coming out of the studies um, maybe 10 or so years ago. But there's actually new, pretty new data that suggests it's um, as high as perhaps 14 to 20%. Um, 14% was quite a, a large study. Um, so that's kind of where we're thinking, maybe like 10 to 15% in the US at this point in time. To compare that around the world, um, Australia is around 4%, but that data is pretty old. So that's probably higher now too. And then in East Asia, there's actually quite a lot. So this is a test your flags um, challenge also. Um, so this is um, Singapore and that was as high as 18% again, um, you know, 10, 10 or so years ago. Um, and then in China, a relatively recent study that came out last year actually found the amount to be as high as almost a quarter were exclusively expressing by six weeks postpartum. So that's a huge um, proportion of breastfeeders who are exclusively pumping. Now, coming back to the, the US, because, um, you know, that's where we're situating um, the talk today is what is an educated guesstimate? Well, we've got this data, but it's not you know, population-wide data. So what do, you, you know, what do you think it is? So I think it's around about 10%, probably, most likely, uh, although maybe more attempt to exclusively pump, but unfortunately, for whatever reasons, aren't that successful at it. So maybe let's say 10% who do it for you know, some, some length of time. What does that look like in real numbers? Well, you know, uh, 3.2 million people um, left the hospital breastfeeding, according to um, the statistics that are collected on that. And so 10% of that is over 300,000 people per year. Um, so that's a lot, that's a huge number of people um, that, are, that are potentially exclusively pumping. So this is not a small um, number of people. This is not some, um, you know, kind of flash in the pan or minority community here. But there's really very little data about EPing or about exclusive pumpers. And that's where um, I started my research, um, which is I called the breastfeeding without nursing study. And this was my PhD research. And um, I did quite extensive data collection. And I focused on the lived experiences of exclusive pumpers. So I didn't so much study the you know, regimes or the pumps or like how much, you know, volume they were getting or, you know, like this kind of technical aspects of lactation. I was really concentrated on 
asking exclusive pumpers what it was like to exclusively pump. Why did they do it? Um, and what were their feelings and experiences and what support and information they needed? So I did this through two different um, data collection efforts. So I did an initial survey um, and that was really quite extensive. Um, and actually I had a huge number of people respond. I had oh, almost two and a half thousand start the survey and 2000 that were ultimately included in my data. And that really um, shows the level of um, support and, and outpouring that I received from that community. Um, but I think it shows that they were really desperate to, to also share their stories. Um, and that was collected, um, you know, around about three, uh, two to three years ago. And then I also did a follow-up survey, which followed exclusive pumpers through their pumping journey. Um, and I collected data from, from this group um, for almost a year and a half until all of them basically had ceased to exclusively pump anymore. So why do you think exclusively pump, exclusive pumpers exclusively pump? So you might have some experience with this in your practice. So think of some of the reasons that you may have heard um, and sort of think about like the top reasons for you um, that you think exclusively pumpers, exclusive pumpers exclusively pump. Well, I wouldn't surprise you probably that the main reason is that they couldn't latch. So I think it's important at this juncture to um, sort of explain that I had a, an open demographic. It wasn't just, you know, um, NICU parents or parents of preemies or, you know, it was anyone who was exclusively pumping. Um, so it was almost three quarters of them couldn't latch for some kind of a reason. Um, and that was not really surprising, um, but I think it demonstrates that there is this sort of um, issues that we're having um, with latching, whether it's pain or um, prematurity is obviously one of them, um, oral difficulties, those kinds of things. So there's a whole host of different things that are lumped in together with that. But I think it's really important that within this um, group of people um, that I surveyed, who were primarily uh, recruited from online groups um, for exclusively, pump, uh, exclusively pumping, um, that almost 90% had tried to latch. So this isn't something that they were picking between um, formula and um, nursing. This isn't something that they were picking between. They were picking between um, formula and exclusive pumping. If they hadn't have exclusively pumped, they would have ended up feeding their child formula. They tried to nurse. So I think that's really important to remember that these people generally um, wanted to nurse their child directly and this was something that they were unable to do. So there's some level of, of grief and loss there, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Of course, in my study, I did have, um, you know, almost a quarter of the people who had children in the NICU. Um, and, you know, obviously that's sort of a classic uh, population for exclusive pumping. Um, that that's, tends to be where most of the studies that we've heard and most of the recommendations um, that we have. And that's, of course, an absolutely essential um, piece of the puzzle for NICU parents and, and people supporting those people in NICU. You know, how important human milk is for those um, sick and premature and um, low birth weight infants. It's so important, of course, but that was not the only uh, focus of my study. And then I think it's important to also come back to only 8%, so fewer than one in 10 uh, people in my study just wanted to exclusively pump. This was not, this was not a choice that they were making because it was a lifestyle choice or um, it was more sort of convenient. It, it wasn't something that they just wanted to do. And of course, if they do, then of I'm obviously we want to support them in that. But I think that sometimes um, I've seen people kind of have this impression that like it's just the pumping is, is this thing that's sort of a, um, you know, it's the modern, modern way to breastfeed or, you know, people are sort of just choosing it because it's kind of cool. So those were the check boxes that the people in my study could pick. But I also asked them to explain and share in their own words why they exclusively pumped. And this was some absolutely heartbreaking stories and people shared at great length, you know, all of the um, problems they had experienced and the, the heartbreak and the things that they had tried and the sleepless nights and all of those things that were very vivid in these um, people's memories. And 
you know, you get a lot of the same responses like latch problem. Um, weight loss was another one where people were having to sort of track their um, uh, baby's intake. Um, inefficient nursing was another one. Um, but you also got this um, idea of a frustrated baby that came out of um, the open-ended responses. These were things like my baby was frustrated at my breast. Um, you know, I was crying, they were crying, they were pushing me away and those kinds of things. So, you know, I think that if you've, um, you know, been in practice, you've probably seen this. Um, and it, but it's very difficult, um, I think, for a lot of parents, especially new first time parents, that don't understand um you know what's going on and of course there could be many different reasons um why that child is, is being frustrated and, and upset at the breast and i think you know it, it's something that i definitely um would encourage a little more investigation of both you know from a academic point of view but also a um you know if you're in practice and and someone's saying oh well, i'm you know my baby's frustrated or you know like i just can't get them to latch like to kind of explore a little bit maybe you know what's going on there and and really um counsel about the the tips and and things to sort of settle that baby back down again perhaps um you know so that you can establish nursing in a more peaceful and calm way because of course that's upsetting for parents um to feel like their baby's pushing them away or they're upset by trying to feed them so why do you think that exclusive pumpers stop exclusively pumping Again, I want you to think of, okay, you've, you've probably, you know, seen people exclusively pump and like, you know, why did they stop exclusively pumping? What were their reasons? Did you, did you even really know that they had stopped because they maybe didn't continue to seek out um, support? So this may be second time parents that said that, oh, I exclusive, I tried to exclusively pump the first time and it didn't work. Um, so let's have a look at why because i think that if we can understand why then maybe we can um, make these people's journeys longer and therefore feed their babies longer so um you know the number one was they reached their goal right and i think that that's that's really important to um you know really think about um because um you know they they had this goal in mind and i think that exclusively pumping because it's sort of separate separated somewhat from from their own baby they're sort of taking the metrics down they're recording things and then that kind of inspires a, a goal um and um, a lot of goals were six months or 12 months which i think is the same for any kind of breastfeeding and people have these sort of ideas in mind um but when it's just between you and a pump um you know that's a lot easier to kind of wean off of um by choice than if you're still feeding a baby at the breast who you know is maybe um demanding feeding um, a pump doesn't demand in the same kind of way, of course. Um, but, you know, it, it's so um, over a third had reached the goal they set themselves, which is kind of great because, you know, that that's what we want to see. We want to see people, um, you know, obtain um, the, the feeding outcomes that they intend. However, that's still only a third of people. So what's happening to the rest? Low supply and dwindling supply, of course, um, is, uh, you know, a problem for a lot of breastfeeders particularly in a modern world where we don't necessarily um breastfeed in in a more sort of biological norm way um but the the issue of course with pumping is um you know that's not the physiological process um that our bodies are built for um and you know so people's supply dwindles and the low supply was people who just had low supply the whole time um, and perhaps just felt like it got to a point where it just wasn't worth it anymore. And then the other, the others though, you know, were, were sort of good transition points. Again, these are sort of positives, um, which was, you know, some had enough frozen milk um, to get them to a point of transition um, to uh, non-infant milk, um, which is the next one on the list there. So almost one in five stopped exclusively pumping, um, uh, probably around 12 months because they were transitioning their child to like cow's milk or soy milk or some other kind of non-infant milk um and so those are those are good sort of goals to have um of course we want to extend it past a year if possible um but at least we're doing that first year for these people and then the transition to direct nursing so this is the one where you know we have a tendency to treat exclusive pumping as um something we're doing while working to get back to the breast and that can be the case for, for some, of course, but I think, you know, 
anytime I've seen that be successful, there's been an incredible level of support needed um, to guide and problem solve through that process of getting that baby back to the breast. And for the people in my survey, um, you know, that was fewer than fewer than 7% of the people. That said, I was recruiting from people who were exclusively pumping. So there's probably a lot of people who I wasn't able to recruit simply because they weren't in those like areas of recruitment anymore. So it's probably higher than that overall. Um, but there was definitely sort of a low, low level of, um, you know, being successful at that. And many of the people in my study had tried to get back to direct nursing had not been successful. Um, so I think that's important to realize that it's sort of a low level once people have started to exclusively pump um, for one reason or another, um, it's often very, very difficult to get back to direct nursing. But the people in my study um, were really successful um, as far as duration is concerned. Um, uh, you know, their, their mean duration was over eight months of exclusive pumping. Um, and that doesn't include the amount that they had stored in the freezer. So this was literally just the time that they were lactating. Um, and I had, you know, um, someone all the way up to um, four and a half, you know, four and a half years, and they had a, um, you know, immunocompromised child that they were um, pumping for. Um, but it just shows that physiologically speaking, exclusively um, pumping is sustainable. So one of the myths that's, that a lot of EPs have heard is that, oh, this isn't sustainable long-term. You can't do this long-term. Well, that's just not true. Like it is possible to do it long-term. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's everybody, um, but it is possible for a lot of people to do this for a long period of time. So how do you think they feel about exclusive pumping, right? If, if they wanted to nurse, they tried to nurse, it wasn't successful. Um, what do you think they would feel? Well, we know that unfulfilled breastfeeding goals lead to an, lots of different kinds of negative emotions. So this is any unfulfilled breastfeeding goal. It doesn't matter whether it was duration or um, not being able to do it at all, um, or just a different form of breastfeeding, that kind of thing. And they lead to these horrible emotions of guilt and grief and sadness, failure, inadequacy. So a lot of exclusive pumpers are really struggling with these feelings of, um, you know, just not doing enough and not being able to reach that breastfeeding goal of nursing at the breast, right? And that came out in this, um, you know, uh, melange of different words that people had um, picked for how they felt and frustrated was like kind of the big major one right challenged and frustrated and discouraged you know there are some kind of more positive ones in there um, that were kind of popular picks like productive um, and devoted and strong um, because you know those were sort of makeups for the fact that they still felt frustrated and challenged um, and in their own words, these feelings kept on coming out, right? And, and this is a little bit um, daunting to read, but basically um, the main one that came out when I asked them, how do you feel about exclusively pumping in your own words, was that it felt good to give their milk. It was a consolation prize. It was, they were glad to be able to still give the best start, but it wasn't what they really wanted. They were still mourning the loss of nursing. They felt chained to the pump. They were angry. They were anxious about supply, which as we know is common for most breastfeeders. Um, but they were proud of what they were doing and they were determined to do it um, because of this overwhelming desire to still be able to give their milk. So they're kind of dealing with these conflicting emotions a lot of the time um, about it. And, you know, there's a question of why do they feel this way, right? So the milk supply, like I said, it's universal across all time types of breastfeeding, but there's also a failure to meet expectations. So, you know, I think we know there's a lot of societal expectations these days. There's a lot of their own expectations um, of what it looks like to be a new parent. And I think that we have to do a better job of being more realistic about, you know, the struggles and the strains, um, particularly to do with breastfeeding. It's not like this sort of perfect angelic thing that just happens naturally because I think that we all know that that's not true but I think the parents are still picking that up from wherever they're learning about breastfeeding from and also other people's reactions to exclusive pumping was um, another contributing factor so what are the most common reactions 
um, a lot of the time it was pride, uh, pride and praise, you know, oh my God, that's an amazing thing you're doing. Um, but a lot of the time that was from friends and family, coworkers, um, you know, other parents. Um, and again, the recognition that it's really hard work kind of came from everybody, including lactation care providers. Um, but a lot of the time it had a sort of almost a negative undercurrent, which is like, oh, well, that's so time consuming. Like, um, it's so hard, so much hard work. Um, and then the next thing, the next sentence will be, why are you doing that? Like, what's the point of doing that? And, you know, for those people who didn't understand, they were then asking questions about, well, what's that? What does that include? So there was a sort of burden on EPs um, to almost explain what they were doing and to educate um, about what they were doing, which is obviously not something that formula feeders or at the breast nurses really get um, so much. Um, some people's responses was, why don't you just switch to formula? It's just easier. So it's kind of undermining um, their efforts in a way. Um, and then kind of really tragically, um, some people were sort of accused of not trying hard enough to direct nurse, so you should keep trying, or why didn't you try this? Why didn't you try that? Um, so again, it's like, you know, people, I, there were a lot of people in their open-ended responses who kind of pulled back from explaining it to people because they just didn't want to have this kind of conversation or they didn't want to feel undermined um you know and and those people who made them feel like that were across the board um you know it wasn't just um parents or family members those kinds of things it was it was lactation care providers doctors medical people as well who made them feel that way um and then some people were just surprised um and then nine and ten um nine that it isn't breastfeeding um, is something that is deeply, deeply hurtful to exclusive pumpers. If you say it's not breastfeeding to them because they are feeding milk they're making in their breast. Um, and so to them, they are still breastfeeding. And then um, the last one, it isn't sustainable or it won't bond or provide benefits to them. They're just, those just things are just objectively not true. Um, it is sustainable for many people if it's you know set up in a way that's sustainable for them. Um, that they won't bond is just not true. There's ways of bonding with all sorts of different kinds of feeding um, or that it won't provide benefits because it will. Um, we still feel that it's bad, you know, sort of more beneficial than formula. So what support can we give exclusive pumpers? Well, I really like pie. So I put this on here as, as my kind of approach. So it's a practical um, things that we can do, informational things, and then emotional things. So, Lactation consultants in my survey kind of got a bad rap. Um, they didn't get great reviews um, and they were sort of the least supportive of all the people providing support. And some of these things are really important. So the first one is like they wish that they had been more educated about it um, by the doctors and the lactation consultants at the hospital. They felt there was this absolute focus on direct nursing, which played out in other parts of my data as well. That, that, um, when people did breastfeeding classes and things like that. Um, they really only heard about direct nursing. And then um, the second person was said they wish it had been a clear option rather than something they discovered later. Um, and that again was a, a, a huge thing that most people um, had only heard of it like after they had given birth and they were sort of doing it already um, and they were trying to search for more information. Um, and they then just suddenly found that there was a word for it and they didn't know about it before. Um, and they, and this person wished that there had been more validation of exclusive pumping. And they actually said that be because of the lack of that validation and the lack of knowing about it, they had um, maybe worse guilt and pain um, because it just, they felt that they were um, doing something that wasn't expected or wasn't the right thing to do because no one had told them that they could do it. And this actually had some really kind of devastating um, problems here. So one of the associations with the usefulness of information from lactation consultants, um, so was the, the less useful someone found the information from a lactation consultant um, about exclusive pumping was the less likely they would go and see a medical provider when they had a health problem to do with exclusive pumping or a breastfeeding problem. Um, so this is, this is here. So we're looking at specifically information about exclusive pumping. And then, you know, subsequently these people had say, you know, mastitis or 
um, nipple pain or nipple soreness or their supply was dwindling or, you know, any number of those kinds of breast health issues to do with lactation and exclusive pumping. If they had felt that the use, the information they had gotten from a, lac a lactation consultant was useful, they were far more likely, 50% of them would go and see a medical provider, but only a third of them would go and see a medical provider about their health problem if the information they'd received about exclusive pumping um, was not very useful at all. Um, so we're really setting people up for failure here and for more medical issues and things like that if the information that we give is not useful. You know, that has um, ramifications down the line. So what can we do for practical support? Well, we can help exclusive pumpers figure out routines and schedules and strategies about storage, about how do you fit this into your life? Like how many times a day do you have to pump? Not just like, oh, pump 10 times a day for 15 minutes, right? Like not, but actually like sit down with a piece of paper and like go, okay, so what time do you usually wake up? And okay, well, that's really unpredictable because you have a new baby. Um, but you know, like, let's say if, you know, the baby does this, then this could be your schedule, right? Like sit down and like visualize it with somebody. Um, you know, ask them about their milk supply, um, you know, determine whether it really is adequate. Um, there's a lot of exclusive pumpers who, who feel like they need to make more milk than their baby actually drinks. Um, and there's sort of a thing about having a freezer stash. Um, and I think that we need to help people realize that we really need to feed the baby, not the freezer. Um, and so that if they're only only making, right, um, 20 to 25 ounces of milk a day, well, that's likely going to be fine for their child for most of the time that they're milk feeding. And that's the average intake. You know, so let's let's work through them and, and again, sort of visualize or reassure that that's enough. And then if it's not enough, let's figure out why, right? Um, and then assess pump equipment. Um, so, you know, um, lots of people are just picking pumps from their insurance here in the US. Um, so let's see what they're picking. Like, can we check that the vacuum is working correctly? Um, you know, maybe um, walk them through some of the different settings on the pump that they have. Um, and also for sure, check their flange size. And um, the flanges that come with the pumps um, are oftentimes not the right size. Oftentimes the manufacturers don't make the sizes in the same range as like women's nipples actually come. Um, so it's a question of like, you know, finding, you know, different like places to be able to get um, smaller or larger flanges, depending on what your, um, you know, the person in front of you needs. And it's not just necessarily saying, oh, well, talk to the manufacturer because they may well not have the right size. So what kind of informational support? Well, how to get baby back to the breast, unsurprisingly, was the least important information to exclusive pumpers. And part of that is because I recruited from people who were solidly exclusively pumping. They had like kind of set themselves up to be that. That was part of their identity. They were at the stage where that had been a um, solid decision for them. Um, so when you have someone who who you think that's a solid decision and they have, you know, kind of gone on that path and, and they're fine with on that, they don't want to kind of rock the apple cart then automatically saying, well, let's figure out how to get baby back to the, the breast or chest is not really going to be the right kind of approach. Um, but for obviously for someone who's sort of early days and that's really what they desire, then of course that's going to be the most important information. Then, the, you know, communicate some of these information points that I've, I've covered today. So like exclusively pumping is sustainable. There are people who do it for, uh, for over, you know, a year, two years. Um, the average in my study was over eight months. So it's absolutely possible to do it sustainably and for a long time. So simply saying, well, you can't do that for a long time, or that's not sustainable. Um, you know, or, you know, your baby removes milk more efficiently than your pump does when your baby can't latch is obviously also not true. So, you know, think about those kind of little things that we have in our heads that, that maybe we've been saying for a long time, or, um, you know, we've kind of picked up around the place about exclusive pumping and sort of try and like put those aside because um, that's kind of not where we're at um, right now. And then you know, educate yourself on what pump equipment is out there. 
Um, I personally, um, you know, follow a lot of the manufacturers of both um, pumps and accessories on Instagram um, because it's a very visual and quick way to see kind of what they're coming out with. Um, and it's also a good way to see what a lot of parents these days, um, the people who are actually pumping or breastfeeding um, of any kind, what information they're actually receiving. So it kind of gives you an insight into okay, they're coming to me having seen this online. Um, and so I think it's a good idea. It's a quick way for, for me personally to absorb information, um, but it's also, give, you know, gives me that window. And then um, also including ex, uh, EPing in breastfeeding education programs. And I've had some people kind of take a step back and go, oh, I really don't want to do that because I don't want to encourage them to do that. And it's like, but the people who are motivated to come to breastfeeding education programs generally want to put their baby to breast and nurse directly. 90% of the people in my study wanted to do that by simply telling them about exclusive pumping and telling them about, okay, what happens if your baby can't get a latch? What happens, you know, if there are problems? Well, that's not the end of your breastfeeding journey. There is a, you know, you can exclusively pump either temporarily or long-term. Um, you know, even just saying that to people would reassure them that that's an option out there for them. So the information top three was, um, you know, specifically how often and how long to pump for, how to maintain supply. You know, that's sort of the same as, as any kind of breastfeeding, you know, like pump often, breastfeed often, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then flange sizing. So that's, that's a really big one, how to avoid discomfort, increase comfort. So again, it's like educating yourself on the best ways to do that. Um, and, um, you know, other accessories that are out there that may help with the, the discomfort and comfort. So emotional support is also like, I think the number one thing that um, was, was lacking for um, the interactions between professionals and um uh, EP is themselves. Um, and this is something that, um, where we really want to counsel as well as consult. So, you know, lactation consultants are not just nipple techs. Um, we need to ask them what they need, not what you think you should provide them. Um, but, you know, meet them where they're at, find out what their goals are, short term, medium, long term. Um, but you have to also balance their wishes and desires with, with reality, of course. And that's often difficult. It's like, you know, uh, let's not be the super optimistic person who can say, oh, we can get all babies back to the breast, right? Because that's just not true. Like, that may not happen. Um, and then, you know, be exclusive pumping cheerleaders. Um, you know, it is breastfeeding. It is chest feeding. Um, it, it is a way that we are still able to provide um, milk to um, children. Um, and it's a way that people can make extra milk potentially to, to provide for donor um, milk banks and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it's coming to it with a positive attitude um, rather than a sort of, oh, it's an exclusive bumper, right? Um, so the takeaways that I really want to just, you know, these are sort of the, 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 the cream of, of what I want to, I want people to take away today. Most exclusive pumpers do not want to exclusively pump. They are choosing between EPing and formula. They're not choosing between nursing and EPing for the most part. They're highly motivated and committed because I think that we can probably all agree that exclusive pumping can be a very tough, time consuming road um, and it is, you know, not as easy as, as a established, well, you know, running nursing relationship. It is sustainable. Okay, so this is a way that we can provide milk for, for a long time. Um, I've, I've said about the mean duration, um, but actually the people in my study had a really high rate of still exclusively pumping at six months, which is 77%. Like the, the still breastfeeding rate um, at um, six months is much, much lower than that. Um, so, you know, when the people are supported in a group, you know, and they are successful um, at it and, and they feel like they have the information and support they need, then, you know, this can really increase the, um, you know, breastfeeding rates. And then 
the mean age of ceasing to feed some human milk, so this is people who then had a big freezer supply, um, was um, over 10 months. So that's another thing that these people are feeding uh, human milk for quite a, a long period of time. But they do need better support and information, especially from lactation consultants. Um, and that's, that's me. If you want to um, get in contact with me and talk more about some of the points that I raised today, I realized that, you know, I, I decided you should educate yourselves on this, this, and this, but didn't kind of go into the substantive details. Um, but I'm, I'm more than happy to, to continue those conversations, um, uh, you know, after this webinar. Um, but I think it's, it's super important for us to, to support it, to be visual in our support, to be um, outspoken in our support of it, because it's, it's becoming incredibly common. Um, and um, yeah, so I appreciate your time. I appreciate you listening. Um, I would love to hear from some of you. Thank you very much.